Please welcome Mary McKenzie, who is Research Fellow in Fashion and Textiles at Glasgow School of Art and a visiting lecturer at Glasgow University. Okay, um, hello, my name is Mary McKenzie. I'm a fashion historian and research fellow in fashion and textiles, and I'm based at Glasgow School of Art. And my field of interest is in the relationship between perfume and fashion, in particular, the role of perfume in everyday life and popular culture. Now, often when perfume is discussed um, within the field of fashion, it is defined either as being an add-on to the business of fashion, so a way for a couture house to make money, or it is cited as a means by which the public can access the glamour of a fashion house. Now, arguably, both of these things go on. However, I contend that perfume is fashion. It's not just an adjunct to the business of fashion. Um, it's its own thing. It has its own operational rules that are distinct from but related to other areas of the fashion industry. Also, fashion is multisensorial, and for many, scent is as much a part of their daily dress as clothing or other forms of adornment. So today I am here to talk to you about the rose and its perfume, and I want to begin by noting that there is no such thing as one rose scent. There are many rose scents, the variables dependent upon the variety used, and those varieties are either, first of all, rose centifolia, pictured here, also known as rose de mai. It's most commonly associated with grass, which is the home to the perfume industry of France. And here we can see a workshop in 1900 with the roses ready to be sorted for the perfume industry. The other rose is Rosa Damascena, also known as the Damask Rose. Its origins are in Anatolia and Western Asia. It's now grown still in Syria, Turkey, Iran. Bulgaria is depicted in the illustration on the left and in Morocco, in that beautiful image of the rose petals being put into sacks at the bottom. Um, that is in an area known as the Valley of the Roses and every year they have an incredible rose festival to celebrate the harvest. Also of importance when thinking about rose scent is the terroir. So much the same as any other natural product like wine or olive oil. The varietal, the earth, the weather, the aspect, as well as the method of extraction and storage will influence and inhabit the scent of that rose. Also, our relationships with rose scents have been mediated by scientific advances, whereby the component elements of perfumed roses, they've been identified, isolated and synthesized into many, many parts. So a rose is not a rose is not a rose. However, there is a collective understanding of what we mean when we talk about the scent of a rose, and it is this collective understanding, or should I say understandings, that I'm going to explore in this lecture. So my research in rose perfumes, their history, and their cultural biographies, it took two distinct routes, and the first was a study of the rose perfume itself. So just as there are archives for fashion, textiles, and all of the other objects that you see in museums, there's also an archive for perfumes. And the one I visited is called the Osmotec. Osme meaning smell or scent in Greek, and it's the world's largest repository of perfumes. It was founded in 1990. It's based in Versailles, not the palace. I thought I was going to the palace when I went there, but it's in the city of Versailles. And it's housed in a perfume school. And on the face of it, it's a very modest operation. It's responsible though for the authentication, documentation, preservation and reproduction of more than 4,000 perfumes, 800 of which are no longer in circulation. So it can trace great perfumes that no longer exist and bring them back to life. It's an incredible resource. So in February 2019, I visited the Osmotech. I was taken through 20 perfumes by Isabel Renault Chazot. The only remit I gave her was, I said, can I smell amazing rose perfumes through history? So she picked out 20 and 10 of them are detailed in the ravishing book that accompanies the exhibition. These scents, they demonstrate the possibilities available to the perfumer when formulating scent with rose as a central ingredient and they are all markedly different from each other. Some of them you wouldn't even recognise as having rose in them. Um, rose perfume in the commercial sector is rarely made solely of rose, it's blended, that is the norm, and all of the perfumes I tried were blends. So just a couple of examples just now. This is um, Parfum Ideal, Ideal um, created in 1896, but launched at the 1900 World Fair in Paris. It is 
a composition of many floral notes, including rose, some and some recently discovered synthetic ingredients. Now, it's difficult to point, pinpoint exactly which flower you're smelling when you smell this perfume, but that's the entire point of the exercise. The aim is to create the perfect flower, but not one that is recognisable in nature. My favourite of all the perfumes I tried was this one. It's Nahima by Guerlain, launched in 1979. It's not a quiet expression of the rose. It's very complex. As the name suggests and the advertisement underlines, Nahima is named for the story in Scheherazade in 1001 Nights. Now, this perfume was not a success when it was first launched, but is today considered an exemplar of rose oriental perfumes. The advert on the left is also an exemplar of the orientalism that has taken place in advertising perfumes. If you get the chance though, it's still available, so I highly recommend trying it. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd quite like to go to the Osmo Tech, I'm sorry to say it's not open to the general public, but they do do guided tours so that you can make appointments to visit. They have a mailing list. They put video content online and they have conferences. So if you're interested, please do go and look at their website for more information. The second part of my research into the perfume of roses was concerned with their cultural history and their role in society. So perfume isn't just an object. It's a complex economic, social and cultural phenomenon. And as such, it has hugely varied, shifting and sometimes contradictory connotations. So what I wanted to understand was, where do these connotations come from? And how does that affect our interaction with an understanding of rose perfume? So I'm not certain where or how I first became familiar with the scent of roses, but I understood their link with perfume well enough that by the age of five, I was attempting to make my own version. So I used rose petals picked from my mother's garden. You can see the rose bushes behind me in these photos. The roses didn't have a particular smell, so I don't know how I thought I was going to extract the perfume. But anyway, I used glass lemonade bottles, stuffed the bottle with um, petals and then filled it up with water, but it was always just a mulch at the end of it. And I spoke to a colleague about this and she had a slightly more sophisticated technique in that she strained the liquid through her mother's pantyhose. But again, it wasn't much success. Now, my colleague and I, we, were by no means gifted children with a preternatural ability to understand the link between roses and their perfume. And most of my friends engaged in similar activities. Rose scents are familiar and deeply embedded in many cultures, so much so that an understanding of this lecture is possible without ever having to smell what is under discussion. So let's take, for example, this painting. It's called The Smell of Roses by Charles Court Recurrent. Even though we cannot smell the roses in this painting, we can imagine the experience of the scent via what Christina Broadstreet identifies as the semiotics of smell. The fairies, we can see they're in raptures as they smell the roses via their posture, the tilt of their heads, the haze we can read as a sort of perfumed air, and we can infer what it is like to live in this realm. We are in our reading of this painting engaging in what I would contest as a form of cultural synesthesia. I don't mean the neurological form of synesthesia, I mean a cultural one, whereby we draw upon an extensive and deeply embedded mythology of and familiarity with the rose and its perfume. In ancient cultures, roses and their scent were bound up with rulers and deities and it infused their mythology. So here we have Isis, the god of love in Egypt, who was closely associated with the rose. She was revered and the rose was sacred to her. And Cleopatra drew upon their supposed aphrodisiac properties in her seduction of Mark Antony, and she filled her boudoir knee deep in rose petals so that the smell reminded him of her. In Greek mythology, there are a number of rose origin stories. Um, most commonly though, the flower is associated with two goddesses, Aphrodite, again, a goddess of love. You can probably see a theme developing here. She was said to smell sweetly of rose and white roses blossomed from the froth in the sea as she was born. And this froth was created incidentally by her father Uranus's um, severed genitals. Also Chloris, the goddess of flowers was said to breathe roses as she spoke. Chloris is also known as Flora in Roman mythology. Ancient Romans, however, were consumed with thoughts of roses and they pushed the flower to the limits of debauchery. They used the petals and perfume in all manner of ceremonial, medical, sexual, social, cultural, and aesthetic contexts. And the grandest expressions of rose philia saw their expression in 
Say, for example, Emperor Nero, he installed pipes under plates so that dinner guests could be spritzed between courses. And he showered guests in so many rose petals that one of them smothered to death, allegedly. Um, in this painting, The Roses of Heliogabalus, we can again see a rose smothering taking place at a feast. It's difficult to tell from the faces of the women who are being smothered, but it doesn't look like a particularly enjoyable experience. And of course, this painting is not an active documentary. It draws upon and reconstructs the mythology associated with Bacchanalian Roman delight in roses. As the Roman Empire receded, so do to did extravagant and dissolute indulgence in perfumes. The Christian West took a very dim view of the licentious behavior linked with scent and they connected it with pagan idolatry. The, this didn't last though, they later unshackled the rose from its Roman history and found new meanings for the flower in Christian rituals. So, for example, the beads of the rosary, where it has been claimed, originally made of 165 rolled and blackened rose leaves. The symbol of Virgin Mary was the white rose, and in the fight against heresy, forced fumigation was sometimes undertaken with rose and rosemary, as well as the more usual fire and brimstone. The odour of sanctity, a sweet perfume exhaled by saints upon their death, came to symbolise purity and sanctity in the Catholic Church in particular, and claims were made in the 19th century that Saint Therese of Lisieux gave off a strong scent of roses as she passed. Roses also incidentally became associated with Padre Pio, who was said to smell of roses after his stigmata. In Islam, olfactory codes were also used to separate the sacred from the profane, with bodies of martyrs linked to sweet smells and those of infidels to a, sweet stent, to a foul stench. Rather. However, unlike the puritanical Christian attitude to perfume, genuine pleasure was taken in the sweet smells, in particular that of the rose. In turn, it was said by the 13th century Turkish poet and Sufi mystic, Yunus Emre, he said that the rose would sigh Allah Allah upon being smelled. History's most famous lover, Casanova, also used rose scents to bring himself closer to religion, but in a much more carnal sense, as you would expect. And he started an affair with a Venetian nun. The romance began at the nun's bidding and he details his surprise and delight at the turn of events. So the affair was detailed in Casanova's diaries, and the episode was also depicted, albeit, albeit in a more grotesque form, in Fellini's 1976 film, Casanova. Um, in the diaries, in the film, she is known as Sister Madalena. In the diary, she is only ever referred to by her initials, MM, not me. Um, the scent of Rose Attar perfumes their first assignation. And later, after a session of lovemaking, he ritually bathes her rose water so as to wash him from her body and purify her in the process. And this idea of the rose as an avatar for seduction and romance has become a form of shorthand employed by poets in expressing their ardour, their raptures, their longing and their heartbreak. The romantic poets, of course, excelled at this, most notably Keats and Shelley. Keats' poem, Isabella or the Pot of Basil, from which the title of this lecture has been taken. It exemplifies this expression of rose and its scent as love itself. Isab it's a tragic tale. Isabella and Lorenzo are star-crossed lovers. They're forbidden from fully realizing their relationship. And when they part from one another, it is described thus. Parting, they seem to tread upon the air, twin roses by the zephyr blown apart, only to meet again more close and share the inward fragrance of each other's heart. The story doesn't end well. Um, Lorenzo is murdered by Isabella's brothers, but she exhumes his body, severs his head, places it in the pot of basil that she's seen holding here, and she tends to it while she fades away. A suitably romantic ending. And perhaps the greatest literary ode to the rose is by the Persian poet Sadi Shirazi, the Persian Empire, as noted by many dazzled visitors in the 1600s, was resplendent with roses, the quality of which was far in excess of their European or Indian counter counterparts. They had an active perfume industry from the 9th century right through to the 1600s, and it was said that the roses produced in Persia were in greater abundance and with a sweeter perfume than those from any other country. And the Gulistan has been cited as the single most important piece of um, Persian literature. 
Now, obviously, at five years old, I wasn't familiar with the perfume of roses as a part of Greek myth or Roman bacchanalia, and I certainly wasn't reading the diaries of Casanova. But it's arguable that I already understood the semiotics of smell as outlined by Christina Broadstreet. My understanding may have been picked up from cartoons or from adverts in my mother's magazines. Perhaps it was from Miss Piggy's love of the fragrant flowers. I always remember her having a particular affinity with them or Pepe Le Pew stopping to smell them as he chased Penelope Cat. I can't say for sure. Anyway, access to actual scented products would have been via the Avon catalogue or the local chemists, which I, where I later held a Saturday job as a teenage perfume sales girl. The cover and opening pages of this Avon marketing pamphlet from 1972, the year I was born, and it is dedicated to the launch of Avon's latest perfume, Roses, Roses. The images and the blurb draw upon and reconstruct the mythology of roses as a flower of romance, fidelity, whiteness, related connotations of purity, and above all, femininity. I'll return to the issue of gender and roses in a bit. And the marketing blurb for Roses, Roses reinforces these connotations. It reads, Avon's new spring fragrance has a very romantic past. Roses, Roses is romance. The rush of a blush to the cheek of a woman who thinks one rose is the most romantic gesture a man can make. The delicate breath of the rosebuds in a bridal bouquet. The caress of dew touch petals in the bath of Cleopatra, a young Egyptian queen. And this relationship between the rose, purity and femininity is principally a product of Victorian mores. In, I'm talking about in Britain here. Perfume is not simply a means of enhancing or masking our bodily odours. It also operates as a carrier of social mores, particularly in relation to the moral standing of women. The shortcomings of women who wear strong scents has been a, a recurring theme in medical discourse, particularly throughout the 19th century, when the public were warned that the charm of perfumes, the search for base sensations, symptoms of a soft lax education, increased nervous irritability, led to feminism and encouraged debauchery. While previous cultures had developed codes that held certain smells to be undesirable or improper, the Victorians made the most explicit attempt to codify and inhibit our unruly sense of smell, or what they thought of us as our unruly sense of smell. Um, it's what Alison Booth calls civilization as narrated from the habitus of the 19th century bourgeois. So simple floral perfumes became the ideal, and I've included this image for cherry blossom, none nicer. It's for cherry blossom, it's not for roses, but I think it um, perfectly underlines the sancti sanctimonious and pious attitude towards scent in the Victorian era. This one's from 1893. The Victorian reclassification of the rose as the bearer of purity, beauty, and romance, it has persisted. It's evidenced by the discourse around the subject in women's magazines. So advertisements for and articles on perfume in these magazines, they often resort to didactic typology. They ask their readers what kind of women they are, and in turn, what kind of perfume would she wear? In these articles, that which was founded in mythology and then calcified in 19th century stereotypes is still peddled as a guide to um, finding one's signature scent. We see these questionnaires in magazines to this day. And in the May 1925 issue of Vogue, for example, the readers are asked, what type of woman wears rose? To which the answer comes, the woman who draws people to her because of the wholesomeness that she radiates. By extension, we understand from a young age that the relationship between certain types of roses, wholesomeness and appealing beauty. So to this end, Mary Pickford, the Hollywood actress, took what seemed like a logical step when, as a child, she ate a rose hoping that the beauty and the colour and the perfume would somehow get inside me. And I, as a teenage perfume sales girl in small town Scotland, I was so familiar with these connotations that by the age of 15, I felt able to identify a person's ideal scent by using my own rudimentary questionnaire. In Britain, modern rose-based perfumes are almost always marketed as being feminine. However, men have always used and enjoyed rose scents domestically and internationally. The Greek scholar Theophrastus noticed that rose perfume was best suited to men. Throughout the Middle East, rose-based scents and rose water are part of daily life for both men and women. In Britain, during the reign of Henry VIII in England from 1509 to 47, the Tudor king capitalised 
on a profound agricultural and technological happenstance. For the first time, the damask rose was domesticated. And also there was developments in chemistry that allowed perfume to be extracted from the damask rose. So for the first time, you had this olfactory breakthrough where in England, the rose could be grown and the perfume could be extracted. And um, this is all detailed in Holly Dugan's book, The Ephemeral History of Perfume, which I can highly recommend reading. And she said, Rose greatly amp amplified Henry's regal presence at court, just as incense defined the invisible power of transubstantiation in the Catholic mass. Napoleon Bonaparte was also well known for his love of scent, and even as he entered his most arduous campaigns, he took his time to choose rose or violet scented gloves and lotions and other finery. And the periods in which men were viewed as most foolish for a love of scent and wearing roses, these periods have coincided with times when scent is viewed more generally as an extravagance. So for example, the Victorian period, it was an era of anti-sensualism. However, even in these moments, the perfume of rose has found a way into the masculine aesthetic. The perfume of roses has found a way into the masculine aesthetic. In Victorian Britain, this could be via a buttonhole or in their snuff, which was sometimes scented with rose oil. Vogue magazine in an article from August 1922 entitled The Well-Dressed Man. It advised in a recipe for a delicious perfume and tonic after the bath. Cover a pint of rose petals with a quart of alcohol, it advises. Add two grains of musk and bottle. Let it stand for a week, then pour off the extract and bottle it. Use for a rub after the bath. Now there are very many perfumes marketed as masculine or to men that contain rose either as a dominant ingredient or within the blend. So for example, we have Amouage. Amouage is a perfume, an extraordinary perfume company based in Oman. This is called Lyric Rose and there's a male and female version or a masculine and feminine version. Egoist, the original formula. Um, Egoist is the greatest perfume advert of all time. Not this one, but the Jean-Paul Good um, advert that was seen on television that has rose as a component part. And more recently, Maison Francois Kirkjian has released L'Homme à la Rose. It has to be noted though, anyone can wear any perfume they want. I don't believe in gender divisions in perfume. They are a product of marketing, mythology, Victorian stereotypes and so on and so forth. So if you want to wear rose, go forth. Um, our understanding of rose-based perfumes is heavily influenced by the persistence though of these myths and stereotypes. And there is a surprising and inspired dynamism in the interpretation of these scents by the perfume buying public. And this is evidenced in reviews of perfumes in online forums. Of particular interest are the user-generated perfume reviews on the website Fragrantica, which you can see here. Fragrantica, according to its website, is an online encyclopedia of perfumes a perfume magazine and a community of perfume lovers. It's a place to learn from each other and relax in the company of your soulmates. Almost every perfume imaginable is contained therein and reviews for each of those perfumes is provided by members of the public. And I'd like to look at reviews for the perfume for Une Rose by Edouard Fléchier for Edition de Parfum Frédéric Mal. Edouard Fléchier um, created Poison, Aqua Di Gio and Davidoff. He's an extraordinary perfume maker. And this is an exemplary rendition of a modern rose perfume. It's why I've chosen it. It's vivid, it's earthy, and it's what I would call a complete rose. It takes in the petals, the stem, and the earth. The scent pairs an absolute rose turk with wine dregs, which is a pairing redolent of the Roman Bacchanalian banquets we spoke about earlier, and the poetry of Edmund Ross. And it has a bass note of a truffle accord. So these reviews left by consumers of Une Rose, they draw upon existing connotations, but take the appreciation and interpretation of the perfume in directions far beyond the relatively limited scope of marketeers and journalists. They also stand in stark contrast to one another. So I'm going to read three short ones just now. The first is by Smell Alicious. It was um, uploaded in August, 2020. They've said, Une rose drenches you with a dark rose and red wine, which blends into a haunting and elusive creation. I'm reminded of the movie Ghost, where Patrick Swayze visits his love Demi Moore for one last time before departing into the spirit world. The beauty and pain all tangled up and the beauty can only be fully known through the pain. 
He leaves her with a kiss on the lips and a tear on her cheek. Somehow Un Rose makes me feel things that are universal truths, even if I haven't lived them all or experienced them firsthand. Meanwhile, Roseberry's writing in 2013 has said, it's more of a rose you wear for a golden champagne party in France, it's rather than a daily scent. So I'm saving it for when we sail for the Riviera, if ever. So beautifully gorgeous, it's like wearing art. In contrast, Forevermore writing in 2016 imagines the ingredients for Un Rose as friends. They've said, rainy mid-autumn evening, red rose and geranium are drinking dry red wine sitting by the window in a murky cafe. They've known each other for ages, have a lot to apologize for, but, they bond, the, but the bond they share is still strong, maybe even more so. So this interface between the marketing of perfumes and their reception by the public is fascinating. And for me, it demonstrates the myriad ways in which perfume can elicit fantasy. So within these reviews, we can see echoes of the poetry that I've already mentioned, as well as the discourse that surrounds rose-based scents more generally. But these reviews, I would argue, are more reminiscent of fan fiction. In these deeply personal accounts of what Un Rose means to them, the reviewers have let us into their world and opened up the profound ways in which the scent can be interpreted. They demonstrate the tension that exists between the phenomenological, the culturally constructed, constructed and the socially governed in our perfume tastes. And their love of perfume, it moves beyond simple commodity fetishism or passive objective and ultimately futile contemplation. Perfume and the practices we surround them with are strongly bound up with our sense of identity, not simply in the way that we smell, but in the way that we relate to the world. And this quote from Helen Keller, who lost her sight and hearing due to illness at, at a young age, she became highly attuned to the power of an interplay between the senses. And she sums it up perfectly when she says, a whiff of the universe makes us dream of worlds we have never seen, recalls in a flash entire epochs of our dearest experience. Smell is a potent wizard that transports us across a thousand miles and all the years we have ever lived. So, so far this lecture has been an ode to the rose. It's been about all the positive aspects and the love of rose, but it's important to note that the smell of roses is not to everyone's taste. In spite of, or perhaps because of its ubiquity, there are those who find rose perfumes utterly repellent. So this is summed up by E.B. White in a 1932 verse. He writes, to a perfumed lady at the concert, Madam Reeking of the Rose, red of hair and peril of Eden. I came not to try my nose, I was there to try my hearing. Also, as I've pointed out, because perfume as a tool of adornment is fashion, it's not just an adjunct to the business of fashion, Frequent liquids are subject to the same vagaries as clothing, hairstyles, or other forms of modish accoutrement. In December 1930, the British edition of Vogue instructs that if you say to a woman, my dear, what a heavenly perfume, just like a rose, she won't thank you in the least. The writer goes on to reassure us, it's okay if roses are part of a perfume, but only so long as nobody can be quite certain that they are there. Sometimes the reactions to rose perfume, they're more visceral than fickle, and the blame for this is placed at the door of the devil. At the Ludon witchcraft trials, which took place in 1634, they were the result of supposed demonic possession, religious fanaticism, sexual repression, and mass hysteria. It was claimed by the Ursuline nuns that demons had gained entry to the convent and their bodies to, through the scent of some rose musks which had been left on the steps of the nunnery. The story was retold in Aldous Huxley's 1957 historical novel, The Devils of Ludon, and a barely more fantastical rendition was presented in Ken Russell's film, The Devils, starring Vanessa Redgrave and Oliver Reed. In a more modern tale, 2001 saw a Detroit country music radio DJ successfully sue her employer, Infinity Broadcasting, after exposure to the rose-heavy perfume, Tresor. According to the testimony, it caused her to lose her voice, to miss work, to depend heavily on medication, and her doctor warned that extended exposure to the fragrance could end in her death. After eight days of deliberation, she was awarded 7 million in punitive damages, 2 million in mental anguish, and 1.6 million for past and future compensation. I should also point out that Tracer is beautiful. Don't let that put you off trying it. 
While many of the uses of rose and its perfume detailed in this lecture are now a distant memory, the rose as a cultural text is a complex matter and modernity with its related development of perfume as industry, economy and culture, it's not been able to drive out the myths that surround the rose and perfumes more generally. Instead, contemporary rose-based perfumes and the ways in which they're advertised, they are just as contradictory and fanciful as their predecessors, painting the wearers as either temptress or ingenue. To conclude, and in the spirit of this lecture, um, I think it's important to point out that I'm currently a Madam Reeking of the Rose. As an academic research in perfume and as a lover of scent, wearing a range of rose-based perfumes has helped to immerse me in this subject. Today, it is in rose that I wear, so I will finish with one final Fragrantica review of this scent, just to underline the contradictory, complex and alluring nature of this flower and its heady scent. It's by Suze J.D in June 2016. They have written, fascinating, not your usual rose perfume. It develops strangely and beautifully as if it were dancing at a masquerade ball. It is intriguing and exceptional as it sways to the music. It glides from alluring sweet to crimson red wine to jarring tartness. The glimmer of the jewel encrusted mask changes with the light and movement. Another spritz, I need more. It pulls me in this mystery, grappling for direction and shape. The scent delights me as a waltz begins. The opulent mask is angular, without symmetry, but lovely nonetheless, silently beckoning me to come near. The mask edges and slips. Yes, it is a rose. Party goers gowns swish by me. Their heads turn to catch the lavish trail which sways and dips with the three count beat. They too are circling. The melody slows. One, two, three, one, two, three. The jeweled mask slips, une rose, you are mine. <laughs>